Thank you very much, uh, dear friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, indeed, Kofi Annan was the person who fought for the Global Fund and whose initiative it was that it was created. And uh, it is a point which we should never forget and where we should always think, how do we act in his interest and in his initiatives that he took? Today, real, real borders are not between nations, but between powerful and powerless, free and fettered, privileged and humiliated. Today, no walls can separate humanitarian or human rights crisis in one part of the world from national security crisis in another. This is what Kofi Annan said in Oslo on December the 10th, 2001, in his acceptance speech, receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. I imagine him drafting those sentences for this very special day in Oslo. And by the way, I think I've never been in one room with so many people who also wrote their very own speeches for Oslo. It is an honor to greet the Nobel Prize laureates that will have a discussion uh, afterwards. Welcome. <laughs> Today, real, today's real borders are not between nations. How very true. It is not nationalities that divide us. I think this must have been particularly obvious to Kofi Annan. He was famous wherever he was, at the United Nations in particular, for his warmth and friendliness. And I think this warmth came from a genuine interest in the fellow women and fellow men around him, their dreams, their plights, their families. Because Kofi Annan saw and understood the world by seeing individuals, where others saw collectives, where others talked of units, he saw human beings. This is why Kofi Annan said, a genocide, and I quote him, with begins with the killing of one man. A campaign of ethnic cleansing begins with one neighbor turning on another. And I may add, and we've seen that this afternoon, an epidemic begins with one girl whose parents are unable to afford treatment. An epidemic begins with a man who does not dare to seek treatment because of who he is and loves. An epidemic can spread when labels misguide us to see collectives, the poor, the gay, the Africans, the addicts, the migrants, collectives where we should see our fellow human beings. Kofi Annan, never mind how large the organization was he was leading, did see his fellow human beings. It was his initiative that led to the creation of the Global Fund and it was an honor that I was able to contribute to it at that time as German Development Minister. Kofi Annan was the chair of the replenishment rounds in 2005 and in 2007, where I could support him. And we owe it to him that we were successful at that time, and we owe it to him that we will be successful tomorrow. Please act in his interest and in his initiatives. The Global Fund, which is a partnership that would finance the global struggle against mankind's three deadliest diseases. An organization that for the first time would involve those who the struggle was about, and we've met many of them this afternoon. A mechanism that specifically improved the health situation of women and young girls. An effort that up until today saved more than 32 million lives. And ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, we are here this afternoon because tomorrow we want to see a replenishment that will allow us to save at least another 16 million lives over the course of the next three years. Because we can, because we can. This was, this was Kofi's second great message. I still remember it in his last annual letter. He wrote, and I quote him, the good news is that most of the global crisis that we face today can be resolved 
We possess all the information to overcome them. End quote. In order to put this knowledge to use, we need to tear down those walls, the walls between the powerful and the powerless, the free and the fettered, the privileged and the humiliated. Let us see into the blue and black and green and brown eyes of our neighbors and let us see the human soul, not the label. Let us remember Kofi Annan's leadership and let's start today. Thank you very much. And for just a minute, I now invite you to listen to his very own words about the Global Fund. When I first mooted the idea of a global fund, in fact, I called it a war chest. Quite a lot of people laughed it off saying, there he goes again dreaming. You know, and I, I love dreams. It always starts with a dream. All of us can be proud of what we have established, what we have done, but more importantly, be conscious of what still needs to be done and do whatever we can to make the resources available. It is now my special honor to ask someone on stage who was the closest companion of Kofi Annan's journey. I thank her so much that she traveled all the way just to be here with us tonight. Dear friends, please welcome Nana Annan. Dear Heidi Marie, Your Excellencies, but especially dear friends, thank you for those words about Kofi. You saw to the core of him how he cared about people. And thank you and also for, to his contribution to the creation of the Global Fund. In a speech in Abuja in 2001, he called for the creation of a fund to decisively tackle the HIV and AIDS pandemics. He saw that given the complex complexity of the task, the solutions would have to come from a large number of partners, a truly global endeavor, and not long after the Global Fund was established. This was and continues to be a major achievement in human history. And as you saw in the video, oh, there he is. Um, you know, he said in his own very personal way, it always starts with a dream. And let me thank you for your part and contribution on this journey. Since the creation of the fund, death rates have roughly been halved, and the eradication of these scourges is a dream that is becoming ever more real to achieve. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for having revitalized the UN for its priority to human rights, but also for having risen to the challenge of HIV and AIDS. Heide Marie has already quoted part of his speech when accepting the prize. But he concluded by saying that beneath the surface of states and nations, ideas and languages, lies the fate of individual human beings in need. And in this vein, he would also speak about how we used to visit people living with HIV and AIDS, mothers in Africa, who might have known that in other parts of the world there would be treatment available but the question in their eyes would be, why not for me? For them and for so many others, there's no letting up, only stepping up. And thank you to the faces of the fight for sharing your inspiring and moving testimonies. 
to all of you, you have shown what is possible. You have saved 32 million lives. Let's continue to show our common humanity and fulfill the promise of SDG 3 to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all. I wish you a very successful replenishment conference. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Anand. Thank you, Ms. Vitoric Soil, for this moving tribute to your husband, UN Secretary General and Nobel Prize Laureate. So we are here to think and build the future to provide hope and opportunity to end the three epidemics for good. We'll see now how scientific research dynamic can open up perspectives can help take up impossible challenges and give new impetus to fight against epidemics and more broadly to health, to global health. I'd like to welcome to the stage our prestigious panel members and Nobel Prize laureates, Dr. Françoise barry sinouzi Dr. Peter Agre, Dr. Ricardo Valentini and Ms. Mitt Phillips. So hello, everybody. Thank you very much for participating in this roundtable discussion. We're greatly honored to welcome you today. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, a few words. Uh, Françoise Barry sinoussi you discovered HIV in uh, 1983, and your discovery has been crucial in radically improving treatment methods for AIDS sufferers, and your work has been awarded a uh, Nobel Prize in 2008. Peter Agre, you won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2003. You will be speaking about malaria and the fight against malaria. Um, Mitch Phillips, you represent uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, which has always fought uh, for a better access to treatment for all. And this fight was awarded uh, the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize in 1999 in recognition of the organization's pioneering humanitarian work on several continents. And uh, Ricardo Valentini, you're a professor in first ecology at the University of Tessia in Italy. So today you represent the IPCC, the Intergovernment Panel of Climate Change, which won the Nobel uh, Peace Prize in 2007 for their efforts to obtain and disseminate uh, greater knowledge concerning uh, man-made climate changes and the steps as well that need to be taken to counteract these changes. Um, Françoise barry sinouzi so at the time in the 1980s, researchers, researchers were multiple and driven by emergency and threats and great since then, great progress has been achieved. So how could you describe these scientific progresses and what has been key to success? Um, I will mention probably uh, only three, let's say, uh, because of time. But the first one is, of course, science. Science, and I will uh, more precisely say uh, a translational, multidisciplinary uh, science that uh, was really uh, done with the objective to immediately uh, develop tools, scientifically validated tools, for diagnosis, for prevention, and for treatment. And this has been very successful. I think this was one key issue. The second point for me is something that has been mentioned already, the voice of patients. This has been critical. And it has been really a, a, a strong collaboration, I must say, not always, not really at the beginning, but rapidly after, you know, the discovery of uh, antiretroviral treatment, the fact that uh, we need to have the universal access to uh, treatment, by the way, it took, uh, uh, let's say, six years between the, the creation of the Global Fund and the finding that uh, a combination of treatment was efficient for patients to live. Six years is quite a lot. But during those years, 
it has been a strong collaboration between patients and the scientific and the medical communities. It has been very, very strong voice, the activists. Without the activists, without, we would not have been able uh, to see uh, uh, the pressure on uh, pharmaceutical company with a decrease of price, uh, with uh, the development of generic, uh, the pressure on government, and uh, as a result, uh, some very courageous, let's say, decision of uh, some government to um, produce generic, uh, despite the intellectual property. Uh, the and finally, I mean, this pressure resulted in the third point, where, why we are here today. Uh, the fact that uh, the UN Assembly and Kofi Annan decided to create the Global Fund uh, in order to facilitate, accelerate the access to tools that uh, were scientifically validated and also a uh, PEPFAR program. We have to mention other uh, international uh, effort like the PEPFAR program, like also the tax on uh, flight ticket and the creation of uh, a unit aid. Uh, this, all this instrument has been really uh, efficient. We heard about, about it already. Okay, and the fight against uh, HIV, uh, HIV is far to be over. So how do you see the future challenges? We have many, many, many challenges. Uh, it will be very hard to mention all of them. Um, but uh, we, we already heard some of them, by the way. Uh, the fact that we have to strengthen uh, human resources, we have to improve education, uh, we have to revise, let's say, or develop, or develop uh, the, uh, the health care system, including primary care. But we have really to reorganize with the development of home-based uh, home care, uh, with the development of community-based care. We have need to have all the level of, uh, of the health system to work in country, to structure all of this. We, we are starting to see data in some country where it is working. Of course, this is one challenge that we have to, 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 to solve in order to reach people and to reach the most vulnerable people. Another challenge that we heard about is, of course, stigma and discrimination. We have heard about With that as well. With stigma and discrimination yeah. to continue, we will not reach uh, everyone affected by, by HIV. So we really uh, need to... Um, it's, it's easy to, to, to say, you know, to fact stigma and discrimination. It's years that we are saying that um, we don't see too much progress. It's probably there that uh, we uh, see the less uh, progress. Why? We really need willingness of all of us uh, if we want to fight. We need to change the mentality. We need to, uh, to educate people. We need to have yeah. more tolerance in country. We need to... Uh, suppress repressive measure in, in, in several countries in the world. So we are there also to say that let's uh, uh, fight against uh, stigma and discrimination. And the last point maybe I will mention is certainly science. If we want to end HIV AIDS, we need more science. We need to optimize the tools that we have today. Uh, we need uh, to simplify the tools that we have today. We are starting to have very promising uh, uh, tools, you know, like, for example, long-lasting drugs, uh, in implants with long-lasting drugs. Uh, so I'm very optimistic about the, the future because uh, science is moving, and we need to have a vaccine. We need to have, a, if not a cure, I was almost yeah. saying a cure, at least to have a treatment that will induce sustainable remission uh, and patient can be of art. That will be already a tremendous progress and I know that patient expectations are related to that field. So again, so we, science I'm sure will be the solution for, for the future. Oh.
Thank you. Peter Agri, malaria. Malaria is still a disaster with more than several millions of people are infected. We thought uh, to be close to eliminate malaria during the 20th century, and but now nowadays we observe uh, alarming signals that indicates a rebound. So how, how do you see the current situation and the future challenges as well? Well, that's a daunting task. I'd like to just share some of my personal experiences. As Peter Sands indicated, we're halfway there. Half the number of deaths, half the burden, but halfway there is still far from finished. My own awakening and stepping up to the fight coincided with the Nobel Prize. This is, as many know, Nobel Week. On Monday, the Medicine Prize was announced. Yesterday, the physics, today, chemistry. And 16 years ago, in the pre-dawn darkness, the phone rang in my house. Pleasant Swedish accent on the end. Is this Professor Peter Augury? I said, I sure am. He said, this is an important telephone call from Stockholm. It's like, get ready. They informed me I would share the Nobel Prize in chemistry with Roderick McKinnon for the study of cell channels. And there would be a press conference in 10 minutes. So I sprinted to the shower, and my wife Mary very calmly called my mother back in Minnesota. My dad was a chemistry professor. He died eight years before. My mother was a farm girl, never went to university, part of the Scandinavian community in Minnesota. And Mary shared the news with her, she said. She thought for a moment, she said, well, tell Peter that's very nice, but don't let this go to his head. <laughs> the implication being that the Nobel Prize may be important, but there are great, greater things of greater importance out there. And with that, and having some experience in our laboratory studying malaria, I was hooked. I had opportunities, and I think the opportunities are everything, to get involved. In my case, I became the director of the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute, which was itself an opportunity provided by generous philanthropy from Michael Bloomberg and the Bloomberg Philanthropies, and funds from the National Institutes of Health, those are taxpayer dollars, and the opportunity to actually do work in the laboratory related to malaria, and to join others involved in field work in Africa. So we have a team in Zambia and Zimbabwe. Where the most amazing people are committing their lives to this quest. People like Philip Tuma, son of a medical missionary in Zambia. He became a chief resident in pediatrics at Johns Hopkins. He's returned to Zambia where he's dedicated his life to the cause of combating and eliminating HIV, TB, and malaria. People like Sungana Marakura, a villager from Zimbabwe, who made his way to the university in Harare, and finally to Oxford University, where he attained tremendous credentials, but chose to return to Zimbabwe to take on the fight against malaria. So I think, summing it all up, I think this is a human endeavor and probably one of the greatest human endeavors ever conceived. And we can be a part of it at, at the philanthropic level, at the scientific level, or the organizational level. Okay, the upcoming challenges from, from a scientific point of view. We need a util, we need more tools, we need more, uh, more science to fight, to end this fight. Well, all of that is completely true. We need sustained investment in the laboratories. Being funded from year to year leaves gaps. And when young scientists are not funded, they can't continue the fight. Many of them will drop out. So I think we need to make it a priority, a worldwide priority, and expand the efforts, both for breakthroughs in the laboratory of better antibiotics to treat malaria, more, more effective methods to ag aggressively diagnose it, methods to treat the mosquitoes to prevent them from transmitting malaria. All of that, and we also are gonna need political organization, stability in parts of the world where the tradition is instability. Okay. What has, we, we have seen that tremendous progress has been made uh, in science, but we need to assure that people have access to uh, treatments, what has been mentioned just before. Uh, so, Mitt Phillips, how do you see, or what is the current, uh, the reality of the current situation of, uh, for people in terms of access to treatment? Yes, I, um, I think that... Uh, we, as many people have said already before us, we, there is great achievements that have been uh, done, but we need 
to fight on further because we see every day that there is still people dying from HIV, from malaria, TB, people that need to take also complicated treatments, very toxic treatments for the MDR, TB, for example. So um, you have already mentioned some of the scientific improvements that we would like, but it is important to bring those things to the people who need it and those who need it most. And so that's um, uh, an important challenge. I remember uh, when, uh, when we MSF received the Nobel Prize, I just came back from Kinshasa, where as a doctor I was um, doing an HIV clinic, but without ARVs. You, you cannot imagine this anymore now, luck <laughs> luckily. But, uh, so it was, um, it was really uh, a great thing to, to see that some of the fights that were that we did together with our partners, with uh, our uh, colleagues from civil society and so on, was somewhere recognized. And I must say that probably the creation of the Global Fund was even a bigger excitement if, I, if I'm not uh, <laughs> disrespectful, because I, I still have the stickers. Where is the 10 billion for the HIV treatment? You know, at that time in 2002 in Barcelona. And so, I still feel that we are there. We still have to ask for uh, a continued engagement and a continued global engagement. And so that's where uh, all the, the, the achievements that we have done and the key factors were bringing these uh, effective uh, drugs to more people, uh, assuring the quality of those drugs, but also bringing the price down. And, that, together with uh, the involvement of civil society, of people affected by the disease, not only uh, just to be involved, but really to help us to plan and to uh, oversee also what is happening with, with these kind of monies that are being put there. So that is really, really important. And I think the Global Fund has, in a way, um, yeah, has become embodied of that global investment. And that's what I think most of us are here for. We want, we know that the war is not over, the war chest that... We have to pull our energies together and, and yeah. make sure that as long as the war needs to go on, we need to go on also. Thank you. Ricardo Valentini, um, we take a bit distance from the fight against the epidemics, but your work is uh, at the heart of the CDGs. So, uh, because your work links um, climate and health, can you tell us a bit about this interaction between climate change and health? Can you give us some concrete examples? Yeah, actually, thank you for, for this. Actually, it's very, I was very impressed by the, the presentation of Peter Sands and all the other speakers, and particularly looking at this. Uh, um, terrific results that the Global Health Fund has really done from 2002 to, to now. And um, looking at this business as usual graph of Peter Sands, I was a little bit, uh, you know, reflecting on the fact that, but did we take into account climate change? This is uh, actually an emerging threat to humanity, and we are discovering, as a scientist now, it's more than 30 years that we are working on this, and we have been, okay, awarded by the Nobel Prize as a collective, as a community in 2007. Um, at that time, still the governments were not so involved. Now, even we can say that uh, you know the, the young people are more interested, I would say, and more understanding our results than the governments. Anyway, but anyway, this is very important for for health because uh, climate change are occurring already. Climate change is on. We are in the climate change era, so we are experiencing. For example, in the two. We have passing from, uh, uh, from the 80s, uh, uh, we had about 1.3 billion of people, this was a World Health Organization, 1.3 billion people affected by extreme events and health associated with the extreme events. Now we have 1.8 billion people affected, 40% more only in 10 years. So we are seeing this fast, rapid uh, effects of climate change also on health in terms of, uh, because health means, for example, you have more floods, you have more water, you have higher temperature, wet or born disease are very much dependent on this. They are changing, they are moving from one continent to another. Um, also food and security is important, nutrition is important because, you know, you know 
is an indirect effect of, uh, of weakness and health. So I would say that this business usual scenario is not business usual, it's very dynamic. And this is why the fight is not over. We have to take into account this uh, extra, extra burden of climate change on health. And so I'm really worried that we're really able to mobilize the resources and the ideas and the solutions because that's absolutely could be much worse than we expect, although the results are, are absolutely extraordinary. And do you think we are facing, or uh, we will be facing one day, uh, choices, impossible choices, I would say, between uh, environmental and fighting uh, epidemics? Well, I think that, uh, no, uh, indeed, actually, uh, there is a lot of synergy because um, I would say that uh, we should, uh, fighting climate change, for example, ad adapting our society to, to climate extreme variability and so on, it also have, have implications. For example, what is scarcity is one of the major threats for billions of people. Uh, and water sanitation is very much related to that. So everything we do, you know, to adapt, to the climate change and being the infrastructure, building better response of the society. The problem is that the climate change is, is, is not so democratic. That's the main point. The climate change we discover more time and time with more simulations and climate numerical simulation that there is, a, of course, a geographical distribution. Not, they, it will not impact all the regions in the same way. So there will be difference between tropical areas, more impacted probably than uh, temperature areas for regions, for example, but also the capacity to respond to climate change is so different. The same effect of uh, extreme events in terms of physical units can generate a different response if you are maybe in Paris or in Lyon or you are, I don't know, in, uh, in Nairobi. I mean, that's uh, the difference. Is it so strengthen also the capacity of institutions, society in Less developed countries is very important. And so this, I yeah. think, a very similarity with the global health in some way. We have to work on that. Okay. So I think we are, what we have seen, we've talked already, mentioned that uh, we are not weaponless to face these challenges you, you mentioned. But w what do you need to end the fight? To be more efficient, perhaps? I think True. we need to sustain the effort. Starting and what stopping is? is very toxic. You end up behind where you were. And I think the investments have been magnificent, but sometimes the expectations may be unrealistic. But to sustain the effort and recruit the next generation. Why do you think expectations are not realistic? Well, I think in the United States, people have... A lack of knowledge? Maybe it's a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding, and perhaps to some degree, some confusion about what our priorities are. We have to keep, keep the fight going for all of these, plus the other problems in the world, going all of the time. We have to elect officials who have good judgment. We're not making popular pronouncements simply to get elected. We need to be good citizens in every way. Um, I, I think many things have, have been said, but in my opinion, we need, for example, for the Global Fund to be um, uh, more structuring and inclusive in the country. Um, we need the Global Fund to be more flexible uh, in the countries themselves because there are many, plenty of differences between countries. You cannot consider every one uh, the same, so you have to adapt your procedure. Um, it has all been already said before in another uh, uh, discussion, but um, a better cooperation uh, between uh, all the actors. When I'm saying all the actors, of course, I'm thinking about the regular, let's say, partner of the global fund, but beyond. Uh, for example, uh, we were mentioning about science. There is very, very little uh, relationship, if not, with scientists. I think this is a mistake. This is a mistake because we can do better if we work together. I think the Global Fund should also include at all um, the level of uh, the different instances representative of uh, people, representative of people affected by the disease. Uh, because uh, we know, and 
as a scientist, I can say myself, it has been very useful to work close to, from, from representative of patients to um, elaborate and develop research programs that were really corresponding to their expectation and needs. So this is really something very important, in my opinion, for the future, to be very inclusive in, in, in the future. Thank you. So what do you need? Or what do we need to make, to make this fight more effective? Yeah, one thing is that, indeed, we need to keep up the pace. We cannot stop and restart. That is really very toxic. And that's one of the things that we are seeing for the moment that in many countries that we work, that um, we did a report on nine specific countries, that you see that there is an effect of the funding gaps already on some service gaps. And especially those areas where there was quite innovative approaches and approaches that bring ARV closer to patients, for example, in the community, they, those are the first to suffer. And that's what we need to avoid also. If you have stockouts, you have also um, the credibility of the health system that will suffer from it, the health worker loses also his face in, in front of the patient. So, and all these innovations that we spoke about, I think we need to keep in mind that we have to bring the prices down to keep that affordable for people. So we are doing uh, this uh, special campaign on bringing the price of beta quillin down for the MDR-TB to one dollar a day. And uh, I think that's just an example. We, we have, uh, and I think we have done it before, we've done it before together and we can still do it again. And the one other thing is besides the dream, I would like us to be also very pragmatic. And uh, it has already been said that Every country is different, and we should look at the reality of the countries. Nowadays, we speak a lot about countries uh, transitioning out of in international assistance and uh, making uh, the domestic resources pay for most of it. We have to look at that very carefully in order not to increase gaps or not to increase the risks uh, which, finally, the patients will pay. Ricardo Valentini. Yeah, I think that uh, it's important to create a synergy uh, between the climate change community and the health community because that's uh, the really two major threats are interrelated, but also the solutions are interrelated, not only the problems. So spending money in infrastructure, in adapting to climate change should also be as a response to health problems, to sanitation, quality of life, and so on. So that's maybe is a really a global risk we are talking about. I don't know if we are prepared at the level of intergovernmental bodies, agencies, to discuss in this energetic way. This is my dream, right? Trying to <laughs> stimulate the creation of a global risk uh, unit or something that could really uh, put together things uh, and find common solutions and also maybe save money in putting together resources. And do you think we could imagine a funding model similar to the one of the Global Fund you for the for, climate for, change? Oh. Yeah, okay, yes, of course, there is still under discussion. I mean, you, are, you have achieved more, I have to say. I'm a little bit jealous because it's, you have achieved really more than climate. The Green Fund is, is, is there for many years, but uh, yeah, something like that will be necessary. But um, again, let's find a way which we, we really respond to the risk, the risk of humanity. We are discussing about these things, not just you know, semantic or disciplines. We are discussing about the future of the humans in the earth. So it's very important. So the, the, keep in mind this. And oh, okay. uh, as I can say, the last bit that also let's focus on urban areas. For us as climate change, they are becoming hotspots of uh, climate impacts, but I would assume also hotspots of health problems. And, uh, and that's, I think, uh, is an emerging issue. Are we really uh, uh, trying to provide solutions in the urban areas that are growing everywhere in Africa and Southeast Asia and everywhere, really. Thank you, and I would like to conclude this uh, discussion with the last question for everybody. Are you optimistic about the future? Uh, as a scientist, fight. I'm always optimistic because I believe in science and I believe that uh, we will find a solution, for sure. So, but of course, it depends of uh, new generation of scientists. It depends uh, the way that these scientists will work together. 
uh, we have to stimulate them, you know, to work as a network of uh, researchers uh, at international level to work in relationship with the population and with patients. This is very important for me. In that case, I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic uh, if uh, tomorrow we have good news. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is really uh, depending of the news that will be announced tomorrow. Um, and finally, I will say that um, I would like, for the end of my life, uh, one of my dreams uh, to become reality and not to become a nightmare. Like Kofi Annan, I would love, you know, to see uh, the end of it. at least HIV AIDS and uh, why not a better health for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. I echo that. I have unbridled optimism. As a father and now as a grandfather, I realize that my generation, the baby boomers, we got a lot done, but we didn't get it all done. And the next generation will have a large responsibility, but they're up to it. In North America, there's a beautiful culture of the Native American Indians. And while they were technologically not advanced, they were very wise. Important decisions were always made with a view how this would affect the tribe seven generations in the future. Think of that. The grandchildren of my grandchildren's grandchildren. But what happens here tomorrow will be seven generations in the future. And we have the opportunity of taking this dream of Kofi Annan and changing the world for the better, which will outlast us all by, by 200 years. Yes, I'm optimistic and a realist at the same time. So I'm optimistic because I think there is global solidarity and that uh, there has been, it has been shown that we can make this a global fight. So whatever, wherever people are and in need of treatment, we should try to reach them. So is it in fragile context, in uh, areas of conflict or where there is other epidemics going on, but also in the middle income countries uh, that uh, are facing transition that's really important. People who, have, uh, who are marginalized, criminalized really, so that will be the measure of success I think if we can reach those and that we keep that uh, solidarity uh, alive and uh, well also translating really in concrete results for people living with the disease. Well, you know, as a scientist also, myself, we have dreams as scientists. No? We have, I think we have uh, dedicated our lives to, to, to find discoveries, to, find, to understand and to find solutions. No? This is our mission, okay? But uh, I can define myself a concerned optimist. It's a new category that uh, we can invent, but it uh, means that uh, I see too, a too slow response from, from the institution and politics, what we have in front of us, and this makes me a little bit concerned. But this doesn't mean I'm not optimistic. Optimistic with some concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much again for coming and sharing. Thank you for your incredible Nobel laureate panelists for coming and sharing uh, the future, your vision of the future with us and your, for reminding us, I think, the importance of, of course, excellent scientific excellence, but also optimism and enthusiasm and a lot of energy. Thank you.